Good evening and welcome to another episode of The Cycling Physios. We've got a really special edition tonight because it's not just Bianca and myself and perhaps one guest joining us, but we've got four additional guests uh, joining us to talk through a series of clinical case discussions. Um, we have on the, the panel tonight, we've got John Dennis, who is the, the godfather of bike fitting uh, and actually trained for me. Uh, we've got Nicola, uh, we've got John Phelan, and we've also got Brian uh, McCullough. Um, and, and obviously Bianca and myself. So the, the format is we're gonna talk through a few different cases. If you've got questions as we're going along, please do pop them in the chat box and we'll address them uh, mm -hmm. as we go through the, the, the presentations or with the, the case discussions. And then we'll sort of talk through as a, a group how maybe we would have handled it or we're gonna ask our colleagues uh, what they may have done or what they may have done differently. Because there's always a, a variety of different ways to, to get to that end solution. So um, I'll hand over the, the mic to my colleagues first of all and allow them just to introduce themselves, uh, just say where they're from, where their clinics are. So, of course, if you want to get in touch with them for further advice, you can do. And we'll share contact details at the end of the presentation. So first on the list there is John Dennis. John, do you want to tell us a, a bit more about yourself? Um, yeah, um, I think the godfather just means that I'm the oldest is probably how that translates as. But um, uh, yeah, my uh, business and clinic is Physio House up in Newcastle, um, which is actually just in the process of becoming outdated because we are rebranding and expanding. And uh, from pretty much this next this week, pretty much we're going to be uh, rebranded as Momentum, um, which has uh, obviously connotations for um, bikes um, and getting faster and better and more comfortable. Something, but also physical health as well. So we are trying to set ourselves up as a bit of a high performance center, which includes um, strength conditioning and, and the physio and everything as well. So we've got a, a bit of a team um, which is growing a little bit, but we're just uh, evolving that as we speak. And um, so it's exciting times, um, but we're just in the process of making that, uh, that building correct. My background's really um, working in elite sports and um, with British Triathlon for a number of years, which evolved into bike fitting in a relationship with Retool, which I taught on their behalf sort of all over the place for a while. Um, but that's what we use as a technology um, and use it to sort of uh, interpret what we see on the bike. But that's what we'll come on to talk to you about in a little while. Cool. Nicola, do you want to tell us where you are and uh, where your clinic is? Sure. Um, so I uh, run Fellow Physio. Um, I'm based in London, so in Clapham, and I work now with CycleFit in Covent Garden in London. Um, I've been running Fellow Physio for 13, 14 years this year, so uh, quite some time. Um, yeah, that's it. That, what, what can I tell you? I do physio and bike fit. Yeah. Cool. Uh, the other John, John Phelan. Yeah. Uh, hello from Cork in Ireland. I am a physio first and then got into bike fitting and combined two. I actually have, I, I probably should need to rebrand as well because my other like physio head is life fit physio. And I thought that I might be able to eventually make the bike fit and the run fit come into it. But then I was like, no, nah, I just go only bike fit and have a kind of a specialist approach that way, which I think has worked. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of like, I probably triathletes are a big, part of my uh, client base and start getting to testing now using uh, the Pinoy portable gas analysis kit. So, and that can lead to other areas then. Maybe it's had coaching, who knows? So I'll see where that goes. So that's me. Good stuff. And Brian, whereabouts are you based? Uh, hi, well, thanks for having, having me on. Uh, it's really nice to join uh, some other physios and bikers all through some ideas but um, yeah i'm based uh, just outside bath in the uk um and i set up this clinic having been at sports physio for about 16 years been working with cyclists kind of in a more focused level and athletes for about sort of 10 12 years and bike fitting for about nine of those and it's similar to most of the room here i just wanted to combine those two two passions kind of neither one was for me solving the issues of the cyclists i was seeing um so coming out of lockdown i decided to set up the bike the body um basically to have my own clinic to do what i wanted to do so i split between physio and bike fit um probably the majority of my cases are cyclists and triathletes um, but i do still have a good caseload of other sports injuries that i see 
Um, so yeah, nice a nice mix, uh, but with a focus on cyclists and triathletes. Fantastic. And for anybody who's new to our webinars, uh, perhaps Bianca, do you want to just introduce yourself and where are you based as well? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tim. So um, I am currently based in the Midlands. We've got quite a good spread, I think, amongst all of us here on tonight. Um, and I split again with a bit of a physio caseload and do a little bit of bike fitting at the University of Birmingham. So, um, you know, much like you guys, um, it's good to it's good to keep your hands dabbled in your kind of origins and make sure that you don't de-skill in your kind of physio areas. I think that's really important still to practice that. Yeah, and I suppose I should introduce myself finally. Um, so I'm Tim and I'm based in the Northwest. Uh, I'm an academic as well as a physio, so I um, split my time between lecturing at the University of Salford and a uh, special interest in master's physiotherapy, uh, sports injury, clinical biomechanics. Uh, and I still do some clinical work, uh, again, based out of Manchester. So out of a, a clinic in Manchester. So if anybody needs any help in the Northwest, you can give me a shout. And as uh, we've identified here, we've got a good spread all across, uh, well, all across the British Isles, really. So there's a, the idea being, obviously, if you need a physio and a bike fitter, uh, there are a number of different people out there that can help you. So moving on then, let's talk through some of the sort of interesting cases that we've come across and we'll basically generate discussion. So first up, um, oh, on the first one is um, there is a disclaimer here. So obviously the cases that we're presenting uh, are individuals. Uh, they're all anonymized. Um, however, if you're listening in on this, thinking this maybe matches the symptoms you're getting, that's not necessarily the case. So it's always best to go and seek uh, professional advice, either from a doctor, a physio, a bike fitter, uh, rather than just acting on what we discuss here tonight. So the first case um, coming up is from Bianca. So Bianca, I'll pass it over to you. Tell us about this person. Thanks, Tim. So this is actually quite a recent one. And I, I guess it really feeds into the statement I made um, previously, which was, I think it's really important to keep your physio hat still. Um, sometimes, you know, pattern recognition. I don't know, again, about you guys, but when people come in and they say, right, I've got knee pain on the bike, you automatically start to think, well, you know, OK, oh, you know, if you, is your load proper? Is your saddle, you know, too low? Are there issues with crank length, etc.? So they were all the thoughts running through my head. But just as you do uh, in process, you before you get them on the bike, you'll want to have a little look at what their actual kind of physical capacity is like. Are there any um, changes? Are there, is there any swelling? And actually, really interestingly, in this case, um, there seem to be some symptoms that would explain his symptoms. So there was actually quite a large effusion on the uh, left patellofemoral joint. Um, whether or not this was causing the patella to uh, present with greater mobility, I don't know. Whether or not he just had a hypermobile patella, whether or not there were issues there in terms of you know patella stability trochlea or whether it's just the swelling causing that patella to rise i don't know but um in addition to that he had a particularly thickened patella tendon i mean it was very twice the size it must have been almost three centimeters wide which is not something you often find <laughs> um, just checking my, my patella now and see if it's three centimeters <laughs> <laughs> I know okay. you'll see the picture in a sec it, it was crazy and I was thinking all right okay well uh you know tendinopathy uh, how likely is that, that he's got that from the bike you know it, surely not and I, yeah I've got a history of some triathlon as um you know as well events so it does burn um he also then started to say yeah well you know actually yeah when I was down in the gym actually yeah that left one is quite a bit weaker um, uh, so I wasn't really sure if the bike was going to be an issue. And if you flick onto the pictures over Leaf, you can see um, on his right knee, so the picture on the left, just to confuse you, he had a relative normal size patella. Well, even that one actually was enlarged, but it was probably related to some previous Oshgood schlatters that I think he might have had as a child. Uh, but that left patella tendon was just, just huge. Um, so clearly a degenerative uh, patella tendon there. Um, but on the bike, actually, he had a relatively high saddle. I think his knee extension was around 33 degrees. 
His peak knee flexion must have been about 112. Um, he did have quite a high setback on the bike, but he had, you know, long arms and, and that worked really well. Um, so I didn't really come to the conclusion um, that his symptoms were from the bike, even though they became, or his, his, his patella tendon problems were from the bike, thought that maybe really the patella symptoms that he was getting or the anterior knee pain was mainly um, load driven off the bike, more of a client issue. Um have you guys come across anything I mean to that to that extent on a on a client and what, what are your thoughts on on like his saddle position and stuff at the moment? Um well I guess that the first thing that jumps out on me is that <clears throat> if someone presents with an effusion um I would be thinking that obviously the patellofemoral joint is involved and is it a possibility that his patella tendon is degenerative but a red herring in terms of his symptom presentation? Yeah. Um, I agree. I mean, from what you've shown us of his fit position, it doesn't, doesn't look sort of wacky and out of the ordinary. But yeah, I'd probably rewind back and have a little think about the fact that he's got a PFJ effusion, and obviously the patella tendon is extra articulate. So we wouldn't expect to see an effusion from an isolated patella tendon uh, yeah. itself. But was there pain on palpation of the tendon? Uh, well, very mild. Um, and, the, and the patella femoral joint either it wasn't really that grumbly. It's a very classic example, I think, of one of those people where pain is not proportionate to clinical findings. But definitely agree there's something, you know, that patella femoral joint's not happy. But equally, how much of that is um, coming back to an abnormal load through the patella femoral joint? Like if the tendon's dysfunctional, it's if it, it's three centimetres wide and double the size. And actually the load transfer through is not, um, you know, optimal. Actually, how much of that is going to contribute to those patella femoral symptoms and that fusion? This is where it's chicken and egg, isn't it? What was, sorry, what was his past history? Has he got any like history of knee, only to the Irish letters, but anything else sporting wise that he's done other than cycling? No, no. Uh, apart from like, you know, occasional runner, would go to the gym, um, nothing. And didn't really complain of it either, you know, so much. I think very much downplayed it, which again, I think it only really manifested a back up on the reason that he saw the bike fit was because he's back out on the bike a bit more and stuff now. But uh no nothing nothing really to say oh there was a massive load increase or you know um there was an injury to xyz he fell he dislocated the patella nothing like that no so i would also just think me? about um <clears throat> God, sorry, oh, sorry. sorry i was just gonna say so i mean uh, i mean i usually try and keep it relatively um simple for starters and um for sure but i mean did they i mean were they symptomatic on the bike did they when they were <clears throat> Sort of applying force on the pedal was it aggravating the knee yeah it's more torque driven um which again leads me back to the whole is it him or the bike you know it, it's classic yeah. pointing water he's low tolerance um and him having issues off the bike as well no, no. so he didn't have any gym. everyday stuff stairs and loading it in no. although he did say that it felt weak in the gym yeah weak, yeah you know. but that's like that was um that was only really you know upon uh, retrospection of oh yeah actually yeah, I suppose no very much yeah. down there. So did you when you when you did a um, sort of a bit of an assessment of him did it test that leg being unstable or not so uh, much loading no. it through any sort of single leg stress? Not no no symptoms reproduced there very much I think um, a, a mechanical a workload related. Oh, yeah symptomatic kind of presentation yeah yeah so really interesting gradual progression was your yeah. advice perhaps well yeah, yeah and hit the gym so yeah. uh he's gone away with advice on you know uh, patella tendon loading and yeah um that's the mainstay of it really um because the quad bulk i think oh. actually was obviously you might expect that that if the tendon uh, tendons dysfunctional the quad bulk i think was down yeah three centimeters um on that limb versus the contralateral mm. side so that's the one i'm really interested involved. in the fact that he, he had a sorry john um i'm really interested that he had a pfj effusion um mm. because i would personally say that's not a common finding with the patella tendinopathy yeah. um i would expect to find a reduced quad strength and quad ball with a pfj with effusion as well due to inhibition associated with swelling um 
Whereas often I find that with patellar tendinopathy, it's the strong leg that is the tendinopathic one. It's the one that they've overdriven, overused. And if you test them, they're actually, they are quite strong despite being in pain. Um, and so, yeah, I, just, I wonder systemically, have you any other tendon thickened areas, like you know, looking at his Achilles or any other tendon? No. And also, mm -hmm. you know, he's presenting with a monoarthropathy, uh, which is what it sounds like, you know, a, a one off swollen knee without obvious events. I, I definitely dig into sort of, some of the other medical side of things as well um uh, if he's not sort of specifically provoking the exam but yeah i personally think there's a big pfj question to be answered there and whether he notices the onset of swelling in the knee uh versus he won't necessarily tell you the patella tendon got thick at this point because like as you know it'll have happened over time but uh yeah yeah, yeah interested to see about his pfj and um uh, the, the the swelling there i mean would you say the rest of his Fit position assessment was kind of neutral. I mean, it's sort of, I mean, it's obviously his knee extensions on the more extended side, but it's um, other than other than that, was it was everything else kind of ticked a box? Yeah, uh, apart from um, uh, cleat wear. So you know the 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 usual consumables um, uh, and stem length was thirty mil too long easily. Um, but so how much of that, again, would have an impact on force generation through the lower limbs? Because, okay, we know we've got an organic issue here off the bike, but um, if you can't optimally stabilise through your upper limb, how much is that having an impact as well? Um, so if his stem was that long, was he not sitting forward? forward? No. Nope. <laughs> mm. This guy is a, a massive superman on the bike, you know, just one of those classic people who just get on with life and... Mm. have no complaints typically and it's only when you go digging you find find something otherwise they would never ordinarily have spotted it themselves well, then maybe it is just a you know a, a, an anatomical variation um and this maybe kind of links into you know sometimes we go looking for things that are wrong um whereas actually they are just normal variations um and you know a little bit of swelling here a little bit of swelling there maybe isn't a problem uh, and it might just be symptomatic of some loading, uh, which will then settle down. So, yeah, maybe we sort of we don't need to chase everything and it just go more on the symptoms. An interesting one, to say the very least. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I think really, hopefully, it seems like a relatively easy conclusion, but it could very much be a different case, I think, in another person. It just goes to show how tendinopathies present and patellofemoral joint pain presents very differently in each individual so there was quite a good paper follow-up yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a good paper if anyone was interested in um sort of joint forces there was a good paper published by bjsm i think it was even just last week um the title is may the force be with you uh, and just reviewing patellofemoral joint forces during different activities um, and just kind of recapping some of the um, well, essentially the free body diagram uh, ways of calculating. So um, that's one of the things that I, I, I teach on at uh, the clinical biomechanics, actually calculating some of those forces involved in the, the joint compression forces and joint reaction forces. Um, okay, should we sort of move on? Um, so this is one actually from me. Uh, so this was a, a rider that I'd seen multiple times. He was a sort of semi-pro rider. Um, so I'd seen him for bike fits whenever he was given a new bike by the team. Um, and mid-season, he comes back in because he's crashed his bike. Um, and he's had it put back together again by the mechanic, but he's saying it just feels twisted. There's something wrong with the bike. So he comes in um, and he's got this massive um, asymmetry in terms of his knee forward or foot. Um, and it was in the region of about sort of 15, 20 mil difference between his left and right sides. Uh, and I know, obviously, from fitting him several times previously, that he was, you know, within a, within a couple of millimetres, he was symmetrical. So this is a snapshot of his retool data. Um, and we went from taking him from minus 16 uh, and then correcting that to minus four. And my sort of question, therefore, would be, if you look at kind of the rest of the data there, is what could I have done in order to correct that twist to take him from negative 16 to, to balance back out again to negative four? 
So the change was was a 12 mil difference. Just checking it didn't fit the wrong cranks on his bike. <laughs> have no. like a different length cranks on left and right. <laughs> no. However, I have seen that before. Yeah, uh, I have. A, a friend of mine uh, bought a, a secondhand TT bike and it just felt weird and he was getting pain, getting ITB pain. Uh, had a look at it. Turned out he had two different lengths cranks. So, yeah. Yeah. But no, it wasn't crank length. Oh, you're saying, Tim, he was symmetrical on the saddle. You were saying, did you? So he, he was sitting asymm. It, it was basically he was asymmetrical on the saddle. He was. Oh twisting. yeah. So so I, I just thought you said there was he was symmetrical on the saddle, but his knee was one was more forward no. than the other. But no, he's asymmetrical. No, so asymmetrical. the saddle, different. The saddle could be of an issue here. No. He was that was that was the initial thought. Is that obviously it just been put back on? You know, you quite often see this, don't you? The the seat just isn't straight, and no wonder they're not. Um, mm -hmm that they're not sitting symmetrically um i've even seen track bikes um where they're just all fixed and yet the forces on those bends and the riders have managed to just twist and bend the, the frame or the the rails uh, but no it wasn't that well, um, he had it had a he's had a crash i mean obviously we don't i mean i don't know what quite the force how he landed yeah. all that sort of stuff i mean i mean the, a big driver for the asymmetries that we see pretty much commonly across the board. I mean, it's obviously a sliding scale in terms of yeah. differences from left to right sides usually, and it's sometimes accommodating those things, um, like in your case, Tim. But, um, you know, obviously if the bike was set up perfectly symmetrically, I mean, if the saddle's not changed from what he's been used to riding before, which he has sat on, then certainly he could certainly have whacked his pelvis say Gorillac joint, what have you, that would have just manifested him to be sitting wonky on a, what is set up as a symmetrical looking bike, but it will feel crooked. I mean, exactly. having been away with some pro tour teams that, uh, you know, riders have sometimes come off um, and then they try to get on the bike again the next day and it feels like they're riding side saddle effectively. Yeah. But it's not that the bike's set up asymmetrically, it's more that they're just that's the way that they're functioning at that particular time. Um, that, actually, John, that reminds me of a, a client a few years ago now, but he was uh, that type. He fell mm. off his bike, and he actually now works for the UAE team. But uh, I mean, yeah, not naming. But he 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 just he'd seen other bike fitters, but he 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 was it was so incredibly obvious when he sat on his saddle that he was just like shifted over to the right. And I mm. at the time I was using lollipop sticks to kind of. <laughs> you know, I, I, to actually just so that he could feel the center of the saddle and um it, it actually it, it worked in that he was able to eventually find center again but yeah. I, I believe i believe there's a new saddle coming out now isn't there like a shark fin that could help in this oh, that's been out a little while yeah so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to yeah. yeah. well Tim, yeah. if you said like you said if you check it, if check over the bike and the mechanic built it well you know handlebars and stems not twisted the saddle's not twisted crank lengths aren't asymmetrical I'd agree with John. You know, has he, if he's fallen off his bike, is there any degree of muscle spasm around his hip yeah, exactly. uh, or in his lower limb that's causing him to sit, not to be able yeah. to sit square? I smell straight, it's not the bike that's twisted. Right that's there. exactly it. So, in this case, it was the, um, mm -hmm. he landed on his shoulder uh, and his, his upper upper right quadrant. Um, and basically, yeah, just all, all stiff. So, I took him off the bike, I mobilized his thoracic spine. Um, improved the mobility through his thoracic spine and lo and behold he was then able to reach forward for the handlebars symmetrically and he straightened back out and that's what he was so mm -hmm. the, the kind of lesson i wanted to put forward tonight was you know we are bike fitters um we are here to help and, and educate bike fitters um but sometimes it's not the bike sometimes it's what we need to be doing off the bike and this is maybe a case where if you see somebody that that is very twisted it's not a case of trying to, um, you know, the example there that Richard um, put up on the, let me just put that back up there. Oh, Bianca's trying to do it at the same time. Um, that, uh, you know, had the cleat moved and that's a, an excellent idea. It could well mm. have been that um, he'd, he'd managed to knock his cleat, uh, broken his cleat, and that's what had shifted it. But um, in this case, it was off the bike work. And that's the case where we need to think about referring out to 
if you're not a, a, a physio bike fitter, uh, is, is referring out to a physio who can then support you as well. So, um, yeah, there we go. There's another, that's it, thoracic spine first, indeed. Um, okay, so handing over now to, uh, is this Nicola? Uh, yeah, it's me. Uh, Thank you. Nicola, tell us about your case. Okay, so this is an a experienced uh, female cyclist. She did a multi-day endurance riding, riding about 15,000k a year, so um, riding a lot. Um, she had recently come back from a multi-day ride, so five-day riding, 100 miles a day kind of thing, and she was noticing back pain sort of four hours into a ride, so certainly not immediately when she got onto the bike. She could ride one to three hours pain-free. So she had a full bike fit 10 years ago, modifications a year ago, because she was getting this niggling back pain, and they shortened the stem uh, to help with the back pain, and that helped at the time. So just in past medical history, she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2013 and had a mastectomy and lymphectomy. Um, oh, yeah, and then that's just where I said earlier, she was riding 15,000K a year, gym, going to a gym with a personal trainer, so doing some strength and conditioning, um, and she was doing some desk-based working. So um, looking at her off the bike, uh, examining her back, there was no problem with range of movement. She had really good strength, good control into squats, single look squats, all of that. So symmetrically off the bike, um, she looked good. And then um, on the bike, um, she what, there was an obvious... Um, shift to the right. You can't, uh, unfortunately, I haven't got, I took a video from behind and I didn't want to confuse the, the presentation with videos. So what you'll see here is the first picture was the initial assessment. So that's with where she's in the short position. And from behind, there was a lean to the right from the pelvis, or it looked from the pelvis, you could see leaning to the right. And this was happening um, repeatedly. Um, and when so so much so that I was like, is everything level? You know, when you sort of go, I know this is level, but I'm going to check that everything's level because there's a definite lean here. Um, then when we took it off the bike, you could see that there was a lean in the saddle. So a bit like you were just saying, Tim, there's a you know wear of the saddle, and there was a shift to that right side. Um, although the back pain that she was feeling was left sided. Um, so. Let me just see if there's anything else I should give you. Um, so, yeah, any ideas about what might be, be causing that? Uh, Nicola, a, a question for you. How much do you think the shoulder, like the previous mastectomy, might have had an impact on the reach? Kind of coming on from Tim's previous case, that he'd been a thoracic spine as well, or, or thoracic spine. <coughs> well, yeah, exactly. So Tim's case oh. was very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, so... Exactly that. So with that left uh, mastectomy, she was effectively not not knowingly, and it wasn't completely obvious. Sometimes you see people completely shifting off that side, but she was not really loading through that left hand and that left shoulder, um, unless really encouraged to do so. And actually, then when you take took her off the bike and loaded her in. Uh, in, in a plank, you know, like I say, she was strong, she could plank, she could be in a high plank. But if you challenge that plank, then she would revert to side flexion on the left side and a, an offset. So she would load it, but side flex. And that effectively yeah. is what she was doing on the bike, is yeah. side flexing into the right side and causing pain and overactivity through QL on that left side, which over time was giving her pain. So um, obviously we've changed the saddle to... Um, to get one that actually worked and was level and corrected that um, rather than one that was worn out. Um, and then because she was then able to load through the shoulder, we could extend out and put her into a better position over the bike to actually recruit core um, and have better balance over the bike. Um, and then lots of rehab to allow her to come into that left shoulder. Um, and I say lots of rehab, it was just simple exercises of being in four points and even doing simple supermans to actually load into that side, then building into high planks, then building into being on the ball, so feet on the ball, 
uh, and hands out, walking out, walking back, but allowing her body to accept that left side. Because like it wasn't almost that it was a, a strength issue. There was almost a bit of um, sort of avoidance of that side, which I think was tied up into the surgery that she'd she'd had as well. Which you know, with such you know traumatic surgery as well, you know, there, there's often an element of that. Um, so I think just to to um, say, I think the take home for me is, you know, obviously there was an imbalance, but it's then looking at what is driven that imbalance. So as Bianca said, looking at the medical history, looking at any of those key factors that might drive it physically, as well as looking at the, at the bike itself. Um, and then just that shortening the reach. So often I see people come in with a shortened reach when they have back pain as a way of solving back pain. Mm. And often in my experience, that that's not the, the cause. It can alleviate it a little bit, but you're not actually getting to the reason why they're in back pain and a shortened reach actually ultimately can often make it worse in the long run. I don't know if that's your guys' experience as well. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that. Basically, yeah. Traditionally, it's happened. People put short stems on, clip them up in the air, uh, like and put them plus whatever they can. But I think, you know, sometimes you'll find, like you can see in that photo on the left hand side, even though she's on the tops there, you end up actually sort of almost bracing yourself against the front end of the bike because it's almost like there's no room to relax into. So it's kind of getting the balance between both of those things in terms of uh, getting the reach and the drop correct. Um, otherwise, you just end up putting more pressure onto the through your, your shoulders and, and uh, upper body as well. So it's. Uh, you've got again, between the two. Sorry. Hey, in that in that first picture as well, she's on the tops because she she didn't feel that's where she wanted to be, yeah. and yet actually when we changed it, then she was like totally comfortable being on the huds. So yeah. Yeah. it looks much better on the one on the right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even looking yeah, at the that's a really good point is to look at that. I'm looking at the hood angle on the the left as well. Did you change the the hood angle? It looks like she's more comfortable getting a obviously wrists out there, but sometimes that's the case that when the, the bars are rotated forward, that they don't feel comfortable going onto those hoods. So exactly what um, John Dennis was just saying, that people kind of shorten themselves and shorten themselves um, to try and take the pressure off. But all it ends up doing is putting more pressure up through the shoulders. And in this case, her shoulders um, were, were maybe not particularly comfortable taking that load, even if they were at the capacity to. Um, and then that places more load actually on the lower back, doesn't it? Um, I think John, you actually, John Dennis, you actually posted something recently about uh, hood angles. I saw on your your social media. Uh, I did, I did, very observant. Uh, yeah, there was, uh, yeah, I think it had just been built that way. It wasn't like he'd adjusted them. It was, um, <laughs> I want to say whether it was a bike that actually had a fixed stem and bar set up, so it wasn't like you could rotate the bars. It was just the hoods were in the wrong place on the bars. Mm. Um, so the bars themselves were in the right place, but the hoods had been kind of almost like they were down the front of the, the bar. So it just makes you sort of put tension into your wrists instead of them being in a neutral position. And to, to just to go like only today, John, I had, I had a client in today who, you know, he's doing this, you know, the, his wrists are like this, trying to get yeah. hold of the, of the hoods and, and he's a surgeon, actually. He was telling me, and I was like, geez, any, any numbness in your hands when you're performing <laughs> surgery? He's like, no, but I do get some numbness out in the bike. And, and it, but he was well able to see, like, it was the ulnar nerve. And yeah, you know, it was good to have that. Yeah, it sometimes uh, quite, quite puts a good bit of pressure into the heel of your hand doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've certainly sorted uh, back pain cases by just changing the hoods. And, you know, clients coming in is just thinking, how can my hand position? affect my lower back and that's exactly it sometimes it is uh, so okay anything else you want to say about uh, your case nicola no i think i think my point was just to you know yeah think outside the box and, and as we as bianca mentioned earlier just looking from a physio view as well there are other things that i'm using to that to that cause that's it. So it's a lot of the work, you know, work off the bike as, as well as on the bike as well. That's a sort of more combined one. Mine was purely off the bike. Uh, yours was bike and physio. Um, so, okay. So moving on to our fourth case study. Uh, I think this one is John. Is that right? Uh, That's John it. Yeah. Do you want to talk us through your case here? 
Yeah, in fact, I want more of that. I want something to help me out and figure it out for me because <laughs> well, I, I'm all, I, I think I'm almost there, but I'm, it's not like the middle three cases where you solve the, the story. So my client is a 52-year-old uh, fit man, and he just after lockdown gets back on his bike and starts getting left toe numbness, right? It's driving him absolutely mad. He, uh, because he said like he had no, he never had this symptom before. He used to do like 90k cycles before COVID. Like, so that would be the weight March, March 2020, if you all remember that day. And he would have been cycling really no problems before all that. And then the lockdown came in and there was a restriction. So he, he just took to rowing. So he started rowing indoors a lot. And then I think it was say like the first wave of the first restrictions were lifted and you could go out on your bike. So he started to go out and that's when he got sudden left big toe numbness. Uh, he thought it was his shoes because he had these old Shimano shoes. He's like, okay, I'll change them. So he gets a pair of Physic. Uh, now they happen to be uh, a little bit too big for him, but they were the same problem would happen. He still gets the left toe numbness. And then he was, but what, what was, I thought was interesting is that he was never ever getting it indoors on his trainer. So it was only ever happening out, outside on the bike. After 35 minutes, he'd get uh, the numbness and he'd have to take his foot out of the pedal and shake it around. And he'd get about 10 minutes of relief before it would come back again. Uh, he, it didn't matter what bike he was on uh, outside, it would happen. And his TT bike would be on his turbo at home. But even if he took the TT bike outdoors, it would happen. His, symptoms so he um if we just move along tim can you so like that's what i was saying there like his previous load was high he could do everything he wanted um and then yeah he he thinks like why like why me you know i did not i changed nothing i've been cycling for years and these issues have just come out of nowhere so i kind of saw i saw him uh would say geez it must be maybe nine months ago and between like jigs and reels and him going on holidays and all that. So we're still kind of uh, trying to figure this out. So his feet, his width of his foot is actually not, it's not a wide foot per se, it's a hundred millimeters. So I just wanted to make sure he was in the right shoes. Um, and then you can see the left foot there. He does have a sort of a, a, a bunion formation on the left and the right. Um, but his big toe is moves very well, actually. So it's not, a uh, it's not rigid or limited. And then from the side here, we can see his arch height, maybe you'd call it moderate, but it wasn't collapsing on weight bearing when he would stand up. So if you move through again, uh, that's himself on the bike. Uh, this, if we go back a second, like he has very good flexibility, back, low back flexibility, hamstring flexibility. So we were like, the bike, see the bike fit, doesn't seem to be the issue because um, I've had him back in after this bike fit to then assess his foot mapping and it doesn't seem to be the, the bike set up at all that's, that's causing well from what I can gather uh, but like it's nothing out of the ordinary here like he's he's, he's he's quite aggressive but again then again he's well able to manage that in terms of his flexibility uh, if we push on you can see here the, sh the shoe I suppose I was Fit, wondering about that because it is like a it's like it's a bit bigger he went for a longer shoe uh and you can't get the cleat in the right position because of maybe because of the physic brand but also because it's a bit too big for him so i couldn't couldn't get a good position on the cleats uh and then that's about all you can see from that the lower the lower chart there is just his ability to move and he had good calf uh, uh endurance capacity he had very good length through his hamstring. So if we move along, uh, this is where we did a squeeze test. Just to, yeah, you're, you're okay to move, uh, Tim. So we did a squeeze test on his metatarsals to see if there was any neuroma there, and there's nothing. And like I said earlier, he, he has good big toe mobility, but he didn't have the best um, uh, wind last mechanism. Just it wasn't as very it wasn't very active uh, on both feet and he didn't feel overly tight in the physic physic shoe uh, or equally he didn't feel too loose in there so he didn't seem to think that the shoe was an issue uh, causing the numbness because it had happened in his shimano shoes before that so uh this is where it, 
brings us right up. To, well, you see, what happened was I, I got, I, there's saddle mapping, right? And you can see, again, like he's not, he's stable. The saddle map technology, for anyone who's not sure about it, it's just, uh, we it can determine like the scent, like if the rider is stable on this, on the saddle using pressure mapping. And it's probably a better picture on the right, which is the one that we left him at. And then the, this is the thing now, this is the latest. See, I didn't have foot pressure mapping technology. I only got it, we'll say, in kind of May, June. And so I was. Able, I then said to, to the client, oh, come back in. I can have a look and see if we can figure out any more reasons why you're getting the numbness. So he comes back in. And on the left was the original. Uh, and then the right is with some um, some treatment or with a, with a intervention. So on the left, I was like thinking, yeah, there's something going on here. He's got pressure on his big toe and on his middle toe is up there and you can see the the color and then with the right one we put in a at the time i had soul star semi custom insole and i just popped that in because on the left you can see how instable with, with this black line so it's showing that there's a lot of instability going on there so the insole improved that and also reduced the force through his uh big toe and toes in general so I was confident at that point he took the bike away took the insole out and it, the numbness came on 10 minutes earlier so then it started to come on at 25 minutes not 35. so uh what happened then i was like i think he had at that point he kind of he didn't want to change shoes and he was going i think we kind of broke up there and then and then i said i'm getting invited on to a case study night with the cycling physios i was like <laughs> give me more information and i will bring it up with the others so that's what kind of re has re re rekindled the flame so if we go one more uh i just want to to bring you up to like oh yeah okay uh, that's i I'll go back then because i only brian come in yeah is that my guy <laughs> my guy went out last sunday right and i said please just pay attention to what's happening to see what's going on in your feet and we can and you can tell me so he does that and he goes you know what he goes i think you're onto something with the big toe because when i was out cycling i feel like i'm pressing but i also feel like my heat my 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 ball of my foot is pointing down more and that when he when he kind of leveled his foot he said that his he didn't it didn't come on until 40 minutes so he thinks there's something there that perhaps he's driving down onto the ball of his foot and that pretty much brings it up to where we're at like mm -hmm. i i i would like to see him back in again uh because i have a, a different semi-custom insole that might be nice to look at um and also then maybe focus on his ankling and see if i can see it in there but if it's not happening indoors that's what makes it tricky so over to you uh well, uh, well let's let's kind of work around the room then um so um yeah brian do you want to jump in any thoughts from, from um, you on how you might manage this? What else to look yeah, at? Yeah, well, I guess a couple of hot takes. Uh, it's a really interesting case, John, actually, especially the way you presented it. It's nice. It's interesting to see it. Um, I mean, hot takes for me, I, I don't know if you changed the, the, the um, ratio of the photo of his feet, but his feet do not look like feet that would be happy in a physique shoe, in my opinion. Um, mm. Thought one from a shoe perspective. Uh, I mean, that just never has a toe box that is not anything other than a, a diamond shape at the top. So I would say his foot's never going to be happy in a physique shoe, personally. Um, yeah. Second thing is you've already established that the shoe is too long, and probably sized up because it was too narrow, would be my thought. Yeah. That's also going to exacerbate that with a cleat position that's going to end up too far forward. Um, that would be my thoughts. From a shoe you addressed an idea from the insole which is interesting uh off the bike i mean you know certainly i would just be looking for any other signs of neural provocation or circulatory provocation so again again circulatory issues i, I checked raised, yeah i forgot to mention i did do the the neural checks yeah yeah so, so you, and, and so you you didn't find any other way to reproduce any neuralgia or numbness type symptoms with any off bike testing no correct i didn't no. mm. Yeah, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, that makes point, me think, you know, very much foot level. So you, you're, you know, yeah. stick with those sort of changes. Um, that, that was my thought. Was, was there something more central driving this? Was it more lumbar or, or hip? Yeah, you know, was was it, as you just said there, is it a circulatory uh, or neural um, problem there? So um, 
I think you know we, I certainly saw a lot of people after lockdown because they've they've spent all this time during lockdown walking around without shoes on, mm. um, and they've sort of either sort of flattened out their feet um, or sort of stretched things out, or as you've identified there, you know they've lost some of that windus mechanism. Uh, things got a bit tight, and there's sort of plantar fascia issues going on. Uh, and yeah, shoes that used to fit now don't fit anymore. So yeah, I think Brian is probably onto something there in terms of actually looking at a different shape of shoe. Um, John, um, John Dennis, what what sort of things yes. might you look at for something like this? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I think there's uh, a couple of things that you mentioned there. I mean, obviously, I think yeah, you both. Brian and John are right in terms of you can ask questions around the shoe type. I mean, physically do do a wider fitting shoe now, <clears throat> which in theory might be better if, if he was sticking with physique, but you know, cleat position as well. They've, they've I think changed them this last year or so, so that you can actually get the yeah, cleat a little bit further that. back. Um, so I don't know whether this is like a pre yeah it is pre that sort of development but he, he was getting issues in the shimano shoe as well which you know would again think right okay is it the shoe i mean certainly from the pressure mapping you've got going on there i mean it it, it looks like it should be better um yeah. the one on the right based in terms of where he's loading and how his toes are potentially gripping the the shoe in terms of trying to get stability there I think yeah. one of the interesting things was there that I mean that you mentioned about when he when you made him think about how he was pedaling and he felt like he was putting pressure into his forefoot um, as well. So you know, in terms of whether he, he was lifting his heel or whether he rides, I don't know whether from you assessing him and watching him pedal, whether he's he's a toey toey rider and just from a pedaling technique point of view. I mean, again, it's like a one of those areas that can be a point of contention, I suppose, in a way. Is, is there an exact pedaling technique, in a sense, in terms of what your foot does? Um, I mean, generally, from a motion capture point of view, some of the data that's been extrapolated from pros downwards, you know, in terms of, you know, does he need to practice bring his heel down a little bit more if he's excessively toey? Yeah. Combination of what his knee and his foot does through the pedal stroke. I mean, I don't know whether, so it's, whether it's, there's a pedaling technique part yeah. to what drives pressure into his toe um rather yeah. than yeah so like he, he, he didn't have he didn't have an obvious like heel up pedal stroke in in the studio uh but perhaps he's doing this outdoors you know this, mm, this yeah. is the difference between her and also like he, when i did give him this uh soul star control it's not the best semi-custom insole because but it actually it it were it it worsened this, but he said he felt there was no room in the toe box, so that yeah, kind of yeah. goes back to Brian's like, like uh, I would like to get him into a, like a wider shoe, I suppose, and um, yeah, uh, then at least get good cleat position. Yeah, yeah, um, I think yeah, getting an accurate measurement of his foot length and width, and then uh, working out from there what he'd be better off in. I mean, the obvious ones in a lake, but I mean, there's um, otherwise people just end up getting. I mean, a lot of the shoes are narrow. I mean, Giro. Um, and narrow as well it's just you know people but, go up a size rather than yeah a fit and shoe. i i just recently well i'm now a stockist now of late but like he's a, he's actually happy to change shoes now initially mm -hmm. he didn't want to uh, but now he's kind of yeah yeah that. sounds like it's kind of the next thing to try yeah mm. nicola have you got any thoughts what, what um, might you yeah, I mean, I guess uh, as above, really, I agree on the physiques. Also, physiques have a almost a bit of a curve into the toe. I don't know if you see that. So he thinks he's got very straight foot, so it's not following that normal curve of the shoe. So yeah, I don't think physique would be very good looking at the shape of his feet, as you know, as we've said. Um, I think the other thing is um, he's got very wide feet, hasn't he? Actually, well, like um, that, I think I might have shrunk that picture, but he has like he he draw. His diagram was a hundred, unless that could be wrong. Like that's his version of it. So, mm. the, the, the uh, the yeah, I'd measure it. that in clinic because that that's yeah, that's yeah, a wide, very flat foot. Yeah, yeah. Go Just ahead, in my eyes, anyway. Yeah, yeah. I squashed that picture. <laughs> I, I was... Yeah, is he a hobbit? 
hope he's not yeah, watching. The, the anchor, have you, have you got anything? Because I know you've looked at particularly different sort of shapes of souls. Um, well, I was wondering. So one, obviously, when you're in the turbo, um, you might be like free coasting and stuff. And I suppose you're not getting the, the same free wheeling benefit that you might get on the road. But is he actually pushing a harder gear on the road as well? So is that increasing his foot load? Is that changing then his foot shape? You know, is he pedaling more of a talky kind of uh, approach? I don't know. Is he, when he goes out, how hilly is it by you? Because if he's on the turbo, it's it's flat, isn't it? And, yeah, of course and, it's hilly. Uh, it also, is his turbo trainer flat? Maybe actually he's raised the wheel. Those people raise the wheels on their own direct drive when they don't need to. Um, that might change his foot mechanics as well. And he got, might get a bit more of a heel, heel down uh, loading pattern yeah. there. I don't know, uh, which might might also explain I, mean, I don't know that's my kind of thoughts yeah. and maybe width as well um so but but i think it's all coming back to kind of initially what brian said i mean to be fair physique she's a super narrow and a super deep as well and his feet don't look super deep they don't look like super high high volume in that sense and mm -hmm. um, so i think there's maybe spoke a uh, scope to test him under load there as well on the turbo really just yep. in the load add one other behind. thing actually <laughs> Go on. Cheers, Bianca. Um, just knowing Irish roads as I do, uh, they're very heavy. <laughs> uh, that creates a lot of vibration. And if your shoe is particularly stiff, that vibration with a stiff sole shoe, if it is a stiff sole sole shoe, plus the other issues that we've already mentioned, that increase in vibration can immediately develop neurogenic symptoms if he's kind of close to that threshold of. And yeah. again, whether it's circulatory. Uh, driven or neurologically driven but um high vibration forces can definitely drive that sort of symptom onset and it may well be that you know that's the, the straw that broke the camel's back you know with the outdoor riding is the vibration uh, on those slightly rougher roads so just a, as a slight segue thought you know can we get him onto tubeless tires or 28 mils if he's riding 25s or if he's on 23s mm -hmm. at 120 psi can you get him on a 28 uh, take a note with a lower PSI that could, could change the vibration in his feet and pedals dramatically. Very good. That's an interesting one. one. Yeah. yeah. What are people's thoughts on four foot wedges? I know my one of my PhD supervisors is very anti wedges, um, but I have had some success in, in sort of lateral foot pain uh, using yeah. four foot wedges. Have you? Did you try it, that with him? In the shoe you're talking about, yeah. Uh, either between the, the cleat and the shoe, uh, um, occasionally within the shoe, but more kind of between the, the cleat and the shoe. Yeah, I was that day when I brought him back in for foot pressure mapping, I was doing loads of like I was using in the shoe wedges, mm. and eventually the insole seemed to be the one that I thought was made the difference, uh, from a pressure, pressure point of view. So, yeah, I didn't think it was like. I suppose what you know the way you, you'd use the in the shoe wedge if you wanted to in, increase pressure through the the first metatarsal. So maybe you could yeah, do the just opposite. Kind of bring, bring the ground up to the, the yeah, first yeah. metatarsal. Um, Would you be thinking of doing the opposite to kind of? No, not necessarily. Anything? No, not. I mean, going off your pressure mapping, you think that he's getting enough load through the the first ray anyway. Yeah. Um, he is. Yeah. So. Well, as soon as I said wedges, I think John Dennis, you shook your head at me. <laughs> uh, have I, have yeah. I gone against all your teachings? <laughs> yeah, not, not exactly. No, I mean I'll probably take more out than I put in. To be fair, um, yeah, size or size. I would rather <laughs> put um, a footbed into a neutral shoe than then rely on wedging as well. To be, yeah um but yeah i mean there are some instances you know sometimes where it's it is your time i've used them but it'll be rare yeah and, and that's it i think they have their place it's not a case of you know they're not a panacea um for all foot pain um but i don't think they should be completely thrown out with the bathwater um, <laughs> Well, it was, used to be what every bike fitter did, wasn't it? It was kind of like mm -hmm. you went for a bike fit, you got wedges because that was one of those interventions that was kind of the done thing. Yeah. And you felt like you came away with something. Mm. Exactly. Um, okay. Well, there's a few ideas to look at. I think certainly, as um, people seem to come back to, is the, 
um, looking at different shoe choices and obviously Lake is one brand that's been mentioned uh, and certainly I've got a relationship with Lake and um, they're, you know, they are good shoes uh, for the right feet or, rather, yeah. or the right foot. So, um, but there's obviously other other brands out there which are doing, you know, wider fitting, wider fitting shoes. So that's probably the, the thing to look at, isn't it? Um, okay, so sliding on, I think we're going to now swap screens over to Brian because you've got a bit more tech built into yours in terms of videos. So do you want to um, load up your presentation and then yeah, I'm going to we'll share, share my screen, screen now, hopefully. It all looks a bit pro, this Brian. You're putting us to shame. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen the presentation yet. <laughs> That's true. I don't know what's in it. Yeah. Oh, you got to tell me if that's working. Yeah, that's working. Yeah. All right, great. I can't see anybody now, so I'm kind of talking to myself. Um, yeah, the, the main reason I did this was just because I um, couldn't share the videos or I didn't think it would be reliable. So um, I, I think we've had a really nice mix of some physio focus, some physio bike fit mix. I, I guess maybe mine's probably a bit more bike fit heavy. Um, but it's also, I tried to not pick a, a complicated case, but more of an interesting one. So I had a 51 year old male road cyclist, covered about 120 kilometers a week, fairly kind of hobbyist uh, level and um, desk job, didn't really do any of the training. Cycling was his uh, form of exercise. His main issues coming to me were he was getting tingling in his right hand, a lot of pressure and discomfort, felt he couldn't control the bike well at his left hand, which we'll come on to. Um, he had lower back pain and his, he had aching and discomfort in, in both of his feet. Um, his past medical history is probably the most relevant part of this. So he had birth defects affecting his left hand. So he had a shortened thumb and middle finger um, and significantly shortened his other three fingers. Um, his left foot was shortened through his metatarsals and toes. So he was a net three sizes smaller uh, on the left hand side uh, compared to the right hand side. Uh, and he also had type two diabetes. Um, so I, I've split the findings into kind of upper limb and lower limb just to try and focus on the two areas, not how I would necessarily process or look at it, fit, but, um, he had a long reach, uh, to his hoods, which was exacerbated by the fact that he had mechanical hydraulic hoods, uh, but, but yeah, that first picture there. So that was his pre-fit hand position. Um, he had difficulty reaching and performing safe braking, which I think. See, now that's a shifting. Okay, well, there's a shifting. So you can see he had to lift his hand off completely uh, to actually <clears throat> shift up to the big ring. And then again, similarly with braking, again, almost had to lift the hand around the hood to actually get to, to brake. So um, this was creating a, a safety issue, instability, he wasn't enjoying riding his bike. Uh, and as a result of his inability to, to put adequate pressure through his left hand, um, he was getting all these pressure and symptoms in his right hand. Uh, you can also see his preferred riding position was back here on the hood. Um, but you can see what he had to do. He had to shift his hand quite far to even get close to the brake. Um, so into, into the lower limb stuff, um, I, didn't actually, oh, I didn't actually put a lateral shot until the end. Saddle height was, was a good bit too high. So he had, what marked overextension of his knee. Um, the increased reach and drop was leading to increased pressure on his hands as well as what we already showed you in the first slide. Um, his shoes that he had were too narrow. So when he bought them, he bought a 43, even though his bigger foot, his right foot was actually a 42. Um, so he had a particularly ill-fitting uh, shoe for his size 39 uh, left foot and therefore the key position was far from optimal. Mm. Um, Additionally, had restrictive dorsiflexion on the left hand side and hamstring flexibility um, as seen with a straight leg raise. So that's just a shot of his feet. You can see his, his left foot there is markedly shorter. He has a very reasonably high volume foot, uh, low arch, uh, certainly not one I put in a physique shoe. <laughs> uh, he wasn't in a physique shoe. I think, I think this was a boardman shoe, just a pretty standard kind of off the peg boardman shoe. Um, which I have, I have no problem with, but it was just unsatisfactory for his foot shape and the fact that he had had to get a longer shoe just to, to fit his foot. So um, my initial interventions 
uh, when I saw them the first time, where we lowered the saddle just to try and bring his knee into a reasonable extension. We increased the setback to try and assist his balance, and similarly so with his saddle angle, just as he was having that shift and conforming and falling forward. Um, shortened his stem to try and maintain a, sort of uh, his saddle to uh, bar sort of reach characteristics without throwing that off too much by increasing his setback. Um, we flipped his stem to the old classic stem flip. Um, <laughs> this was a, a dream for him with his uh, flexibility uh, challenges in his back. And on the left hand side, rotated that hood upwards and flared it inwards and we reduced his brake reach. So I think I've got a shot of his braking at the end of our first session. So we can see, mm. first of all, he, he just he is able to hold his hand position around the end of the hood um, for his regular riding, but was actually able to brake without any sort of large hand movements um so it got me to thinking what more can we do because while well, this was an improvement and he gave me some feedback i thought okay you know, can we look at some shoes that we can sort them out with um, i considered offset sizing um look at di2 or electronic shifting um brake splitting as well so he could perform braking just with front and back brake just on the right hand side so i don't know if any of you have come across that or done that for people in the past yeah no um, so those are some of my ideas. Just just before I then carry on, uh, any any other ideas of what you've seen or any other little hot ideas in, from a fit perspective that you would do for a case like this? Um, Brian, did you look at the like what was the handlebar kind of depth as well, like the reach on the actual handlebar? Um, did that seem like it was kind of optimal for his hand positioning and stuff on there? Do you mean the the reach from the kind of top to the end of the curve? yeah as yeah. opposed to the drop yeah the reach yeah, yeah so the, the reach was was 90 mil and that would definitely that's a great shout so i think that was 90 mil and you can definitely guess 70 or if you even get down to kids mm -hmm. bars you can get down to 60 40. um can you, they're that yeah, small yeah. The wow, okay. yeah on the kids ones I, i'm pretty sure i've seen a 40 reach and there's a, another set of gravel bars now that even do a 30 reach um on an adult gravel bar um and I, I, largely, I, I feel like they've proliferated to try and um, save the problems that mechanical hydraulic, hydraulic hoods have created. <laughs> what your thoughts are on that? Yeah, what was his, um, what was the group set? What was he on? Because you can uh, get, yeah. sorry, tell me. <laughs> yeah, it's, sorry, it, it's mechanical hydraulic 105. Okay, because you can, get um a super small 105 hand levers now so they do i think you i know i had a client that ordered them from germany four tiny hands so okay. for women with very small hands and they bring the the levers in really really close so that could be could be an option cool. um yeah that sounds really interesting i've not heard of that yeah and the other thing is that when you wrote did you rotate both hoods or just one just that, just the um, His right one, we, we tapped in a little bit, and the left one more substantially. Okay, because then I guess the only, it's then what that does to the rest of the position, if he then falls into any rotation higher up the chain. Um, the, my, my other point, what you were saying about single arm uh, breaking onto the right side, I have had a client that has done that. So everything's yeah. operated from the right side because yeah. She had a brachial, came off the bike and had a brachial plexus injury and only had oh, some, right. some capacity, some, um, she had some biceps left that she could actually hold on to the bar with. So she had some stability, but not enough to control brakes or to, or to change gear. So it was all on right side. And that did, that did work quite well. She was out riding in mountains and everything with that. So it is definitely an option. Something. Uh, yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah, I've got a, a sort of project I'm actually in the middle of at the moment. I uh, haven't actually finished it yet. Uh, started last weekend. Is shifting the old TT E-tap, um, the buttons, onto oh, road bits, bike yeah. hoods. So don't actually have to press the levers. you just got to press a button to change gear. Mm. And just use the blips. Yeah, that's another really nice idea, Tim. Yeah, um, yeah I really like the sound of that too. It just takes out all of that that shift from the fingers. 
Um, and that's, I think I, I put query DI2 and the other idea was, you know, was there an ETAP option? So um, I, I didn't consider um, a lot of SRAM stuff because their hoods are also quite big, but absolutely using the little blips is a really good idea. Um, yeah, I will, I'll go through, I'll go through some of the bits that we then did because uh, we then had a follow up. Mm -hmm. um, so we then, we, we, we went ahead, I had a chat with him and we said, like, what do you want to do? He said, oh yeah, lots of drive DI2. So we set that up and we used some similar angling. We balanced it out just, uh, with reference to what um, uh, Nick was saying about his, um, that, that asymmetry between the left and the right side. I said, I did angle the left one up more to compensate for his reach of the actual, the length and size of his hand. Um, again, we reduced the brake lever reach um, because at that point we weren't splitting. And we had this whole chat about synchro shifts because obviously that's one of the great benefits you could just shift all with the right hand side. Uh, but he actually preferred, he, he said, oh, can we leave it like this? Actually, I like if I can reach it to do it on both sides. So that was his then ability to kind of grip the hood um, post fit. Um, and I don't know if you see that. Uh, I think he's getting in the way. Sorry, I'm trying to move it out of the way. Can you still see my screen? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Um, so yeah, so that was his um, his shifting, um, which he was then able to do quite easily. And then I got a shot of his braking because he was so comfortably in control of the hood. He was just able to manage the sort of the forces quite easily. Oops, gone the wrong way. Um, so sorry, that's just all gone. Yeah, so there is shift and break. Uh, so then just I thought a quick uh, sort of review of what we did for his, his feet. Uh, or, or actually, before I go on to that, um, any anyone thoughts on what we've ended up with there in terms of that's what we did in, in his second fit? Any thoughts? I say it's improved his... Did he, have, he had wrist, he had numbness, didn't he? He had uh, hand numbness, no? Left hand numbness? In the in the right hand side because he was putting all his oh, weight through the right hand side. Well, I guess that improved as well, has it? At this point. Yeah. So he he yeah, and I, I would say more of that improved because his overall balance on the bike was better. But I think the other part of that was the fact that he could actually accept and control the bike on the left hand side as opposed to yeah. seventy percent on the right hand side. The only other thought I've had is um, actually links back to a case that we talked about on a, a previous webinar um, when we talked about wrist and hand injuries was a rider who we actually got rid of drop handlebars and we put um, essentially mountain bike touring bars on uh, with really sort of ergonomic grips. So, um, and that was due to rheumatoid arthritis in the hand, but just went for a very yeah. different hand position uh, and just went away from drop bars, so road bike, but with straight bars. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a great shout, Tim. Just don't limit yourself with, it's a road bike, it has to have drop bars. And I've, I've got a, another case I'm dealing with a minute where we're talking exactly about that is we're doing the opposite. Actually, we're building her a hybrid bike but with drop bars because she wants drop bars, but she mm. wants a much more upright riding position. So again, just, you know, not being limited to think, oh, I've got to have a, a drop bar on this road bike. And yeah, I think that's a great shout as well. So what about the, the lower limb then? So the feet, yeah, so basically we wanted to do split sizing, but it was a little bit cost prohibitive because it just adds on to go to a custom program for Blake to get different size shoes. So we set up a CX201 in a 42, which is a much wider last through the forefoot and midfoot. So you can see the shape of the shoe there um, is much more like his foot. That's just from their uh, promo blurb stuff. Um, but the shoe being a 42, not a 43, but also allowing a really big cleat track. We meant we could actually get the, the cleat right underneath his foot. And the upper itself is a really stretchy upper, which basically allowed kind of really good conformity to both of his feet. So it's slightly smaller and is um, shorter and his, and his, and his uh, normal size foot or uh, full size foot as it were. Um, but that was the difference in the toe box but also I, I feel like the material that this particular shoe is made of is, is particularly helpful because it just is so soft and giving to the shape of his foot. So, and the other thing was he's quite wide through the midfoot and the, the 201 last is very wide through the midfoot. It doesn't taper like most shoes do. Um, 
And I mean, thankfully, ultimately, in this guy's case, he's had no, no foot symptoms um, and is using his bike very happily now. At least on, on, on last follow up, he's been really, really pleased. He can change his gears and, and brake safely. But I think some of the points that we'd mentioned there about brakes on one side, I think, would be even safer again for him, probably. Um, you could even um, um, yeah, run a one bike. Brian, I was just going to say, even from his, his shifting, you could get him to run just a one by on the front end. Depends how much money he wants to spend on changing components on his bike, but uh, so he hasn't got to change exactly, on, yeah, on, on his left at all. So um, yeah, it's one of those where he could just uh, happily just be changing up and down on the cassette with either Di two or my E tap. You'd have to change up with the left hand, but it's just a button. Um, yeah, exactly. I think you're absolutely right. One by is now it's becoming so so common and popular, yeah. uh, albeit lacking availability. But absolutely <laughs> another great way just to have shifting on one side. Um, I, I did just put in a, a pre post there of his um, position, um, but essentially we, we can see in, in the top shot where he was lifting heavily off that left hand side. Um, Owing to that that foot instability, saddle height that was large. I think that, like I said, that saddle height instability. Um, but you can kind of see then he was just much more relaxed and actually able to get his hands around the hoods. Uh, but yeah, that's that's uh, that's my little bit. Actually, Brian, so I have a claim. I just about the shoes. You know, you mentioned that you looked briefly into the custom size lake. So I have a client waiting on that. Six months at the moment and fifty pounds extra fee for the customize customizability of it yeah so yeah, yeah he's happy it's, to, like I said, it's, not, it's, it's not a massive cost yeah mm. but um it's just the time on it for sure mm. he, he's actually a client with cerebral palsy so he's and quite a elite mm -hmm. level so he wants to get that get that right you know the left and right shoe size all very interesting um excellent right well we've um we've gone slightly over our usual hours uh, about an hour and 10 minutes now um so i think we'll sort of start to wrap up from here um working sort of through our our list here do people want to just again sell their their clinics um maybe sort of share where people can find out a bit more about you in terms of whether that's social media or your website um and so yeah start off with um the bike fit physio oh uh, yeah so well, my that's the name on social media. Don't do Twitter, because I just don't have, I have a family to run, not a business. <laughs> so I do, I do Instagram and Facebook under that name, the Bike Fit Physio, and like, uh, you could, the clinics in Cork. I, I, my, my my workshops are back. There's one on the fourth of March. That's great. Doing a adventure racing workshop. So there's a lot of things going on, on the website. There's testing and there's um physio and even uh running analysis as well so yeah do you, want to, do you want to say what your website is the bike fit physio.com fine yeah we'll in fact we'll put all the links up in the the show notes at the end uh or be or shall i say bianca will do all that because she's the the techie one behind behind us um so then that's um nicola for velo physio yeah so it's velo physio.co.uk um you can email me at nick and I see at Velo Physio. Um, I am on Instagram and Twitter at, at Villa Physio, although I'm, I'm not very savvy with social media. So um, yeah, I will answer to social media, but um, I don't put much out there, I'm afraid. Um, and yeah, I, I also do online, uh, online assessment and treatment, and I do some classes as well, conditioning classes and uh, rehab online. So yeah as well as my clinics in London. Fantastic. Um, and then, John, um, although your your branding is in the process... Of yeah, I was going to say, it's probably valid for about 24 hours. <laughs> 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 but, uh, so, yeah, at the moment, I think I think if, if you go on a physiohouse.co.uk, it'll, it'll, it'll yeah. put you through to the new website. Um, and But the new one, that's going to be all... Uh, well, it's cost us enough money to do it, so hopefully it's going to be pretty good. Um, but it's momentumsic.com. Um, so that will be the new one that will be up and running, which will have all of our different services on there from the strength conditioning to the physio to the uh, other test and gait analysis, bike fit, 
studio obviously uh as a main part of that um so yes that's um um yeah we can get we do stuff online as well as in person so we're uh, but up in newcastle fantastic and then other end of the country uh back down to, to brian do you want to tell us about about you guys you again yeah um, i mean i i've got um at the white body is my instagram that's probably where i put most of my stuff generally because it's reasonably kind of visually interactive um so I, I i try to put a reasonable amount on there without yeah compromising the rest of my life and business um and we'll respond to questions and, and stuff on there. Um, so, yeah, you can direct message me on Instagram or you can email me at brian uh, at .com. Um Yeah, and, and as you know, yeah, I do um, sports injury physio, cycling physio, bike fit, and virtual physio as well. Um, so it's nice. Actually, one of the things that's been cool about lockdown is suddenly having clients like all over the world. I've had uh, physio in America. Uh, in Scotland, uh, in Ireland, like it's it's amazing how it's opened it up. So yeah, uh, it's been fun having consultations from around the place. Fantastic. So that's just sort of showing me there's a, a great network of physios who are also bike fitters. So uh, if anyone's watching this and needing additional support, uh, maybe some slightly more complex cases that you haven't managed to resolve uh, with a, a traditional bike fit. Um, or again, physio that's needing somebody with a bit more cycling background. Uh, you can see there's a, a range of us out there all across the country. So hopefully there's, there's one of us that's nearby you. Um, but again, you know, I think all of us can uh, relate to cases and people who've traveled quite some distance to see us um, if, if you're needing that additional support. So finally, I'll just say, obviously, oh, sorry, I'll go back and again, Bianca, you're in Birmingham. Go on, do you want to again just say where people can get hold of you? Ah, uh, yeah, sure. You know, we we turn off regularly, though, Tim, so these guys yeah. need a better, <laughs> better chance. Uh, yeah, if you like to book, um, I'm in Birmingham and uh, it's fityourbike.co.uk. That's the best way to reach me. But, of course, you can obviously reach us through um, through the cycling videos. Through the cycling well. videos, yeah. indeed, yeah. And I'm in Manchester, um, and if you want to get in touch with me personally, it's hp-3.co.uk. So excellent. Thank you very much again, everybody, for your time this evening. That's been really informative. And as we were chatting uh, off air at the beginning, it's just nice to, to get together because a lot of us are working sort of independently. And it's just nice to get together and just sort of share ideas and just see how each of us might have tackled things uh, in maybe a slightly different way. So hopefully we'll maybe get a few more of these going. Uh, just sort of, again, like I say, share ideas and uh, share interesting cases that we can all learn from. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, we'll have a, another webinar coming up fairly shortly. Bianca will be again putting out the social media. So keep an eye out for that one. Thanks again. Good night. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thanks. Good guys.